two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Bow, wow, wow. Yippee, yo, yippee, yay. Phase three, avoidance conditioning. It, are we ready? Oh, I think we're ready to go. Okay. Here and see me. Someone give me the thumbs up and we'll get this lecture started. All right. Good to go. All right. Let's get this started. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here with you guys today. What our lecture is on is intro to phase three avoidance conditioning. This is a big one, an exciting one, because this is where some cool things really start to happen. And what we're going to cover today is what is phase three avoidance conditioning? How does avoidance conditioning differ in phase three compared to phase two escape avoidance conditioning? Why is it recommended to use an e-collar in phase three? Are there alternatives to use an e-collars in phase three? That's actually a quick review. We covered that, covered that in the uh, in the phase three escape conditioning, but we have to drill that in. What are the prerequisites before starting phase three avoidance conditioning? Why? What scientific studies are relevant for reference and LIMA purposes to phase three avoidance conditioning? What does a command structure look like for phase three avoidance conditioning? What does a training session look like at this stage? I'll show you a training session with Orfea and me and Judy. And what do we know? Oh, when do we know we can move to the next step in training? And what is the next step in training? Because there's some pretty cool stuff in here, but it doesn't mean you're done with the training. So for starters, what is phase three avoidance conditioning? Phase three avoidance conditioning is avoidance conditioning is a process that teaches the dog how to avoid how to avoid punishment altogether. So that's the same definition that we have in phase two, right? It's a process that teaches the dog um, how to avoid punishment. I'll play a little video as I'm talking over here to show some examples of, of avoidance, avoidance conditioning. So What's different then do in and then phase do three compared to phase two is that in phase two, we're teaching the dog how to avoid punishment by focusing on teaching the predictable outcome of the command structure. So if you notice in the Good. phase two lecture, right, we're teaching the dog the command structure, when punishment comes, how to avoid it. We even want to see the dog avoid all punishment with mild distractions, but we are not expecting the dog to Good. listen on the first command, on tab, all commands, in all situations. This is what phase three is for. Yeah, all right, this is good old, good old Fritz, right? So. Um, I put I put this video over here just to sort of demo. I'll put the volume up a little bit because these are clients that are working mostly on phase three escape conditioning, which is what we want is we want these dogs responding on one word, just on one word and avoiding all punishment. And I like this video because it's a lot of German shepherds. There's a, little, there's a Malinois at the end but it shows every type of German Shepherd, right? The first one, Fritz was a work in line German Shepherd. He came from a breeder that has been breeding and supplying German Shepherds really only for work, not even sport work. His dogs are mostly going to police departments and stuff. And um, over here, this is Boone, which we saw in other videos. He's a show line German Shepherd, all right? 100% show line from a breeder who shows them American lines. Um, 
He's doing obedience and we're working on him avoiding all punishment in the type of situations where he would normally want to break commands, right? He originally came in for human, human aggression. Good. And of course we're now. letting him, I mean, letting him bite humans now over here. But it's, we have every type of German Shepherd doing, um, you know, doing some form of avoidance conditioning over here this is a sporting line german shepherd and working on her responding like i said on just one word that is um we saw her that that's piper we saw her in other in other videos too but the idea is if you look at these videos and these are in the notes not that all the dogs are perfectly are acting perfect but we're looking at avoiding all punishment which means one command no punishment at all and there is nothing that is more lima than a dog not getting aversion at all knowing how to avoid it completely and then in this video too we even have um this was a very fun client with his dogs so this was this was two german shepherds is um, being handled the same time. It's gonna be on you, Howler. All right. But make sure. Yeah, you're in a good position because, where you could let them let the leash just slide out. Yeah. So you can, you know, appraise them when they're when they're biting. Yeah. Once they bite, judge so, enough tension. So this here too is avoidance conditioning. Remember, avoidance conditioning involves not only the dogs breaking command. It also involves them responding just on a single commit. That's nice. You ready? Okay. <laughs> Team check. That's it. Good baby. Now, good babies. One thing you'll notice in all these videos, which is really the base of everything we do with the training, is. The owners are really, really enjoying themselves with their dogs. So that really brings us to, um, you know, what are the prerequisites and what this is about, all right? So, you know, what are the prerequisites before doing phase three, um, phase three avoidance conditioning? There's, it's the whole triangle that we're looking at. This is foundation style dog training. So if someone, these, you know, these particular videos I put, I put public. So if someone happens to stumble across this video, you're not gonna know how to train a dog all off leash and, and humanely just by watching this video, right? There's a lot of prerequisites and you wanna make sure that you have all the prerequisites before you try to train a dog to avoid all punishment and higher level distractions. Some of these prerequisites are you must be ethical. That is the base. We cannot even start train, even begin um, to be a good professional trainer that should represent the field if we're not ethical, right? Some of the things that were covered in other videos, right? Is we cannot be fraudulent, be careful. Don't, please don't be one of these trainers that say like you're force free, but yet you're using positive punishment anyway, for example, and, and, um, and misrepresenting training collars and stuff like that. It's ethics, if you're following ethics, you cannot do this unless you really understand what Lima is and Sinopraxis, or if Sinopraxis is. Sinopraxis is you have a base of, of you want the, you know, the, the training is designed to make the handler and the dog's life better, all right? So if you're just trying to do one or the other, we're not really going to get a good presentation We're we're not really going to do a good job. And so you got to understand what Lima is and also all in ethics, right? Is we want to be, we want to be following best scientific practices for modifying, modifying behavior, which is, um, which is ABA. You want to know some basics of ABA, which is in previous, previous lecture too. And I'm going to lie, ethology, right? We, we need to understand the dog, dog behavior. Why is the dog, why is the dog doing the behavior? We want to understand health, right? We don't want to be doing something that the dog is having a hard time doing. 
you know, if the dog is deaf, arthritic, has vision issues, overheated. This could even be something as simple. Why well, use this Orfeo in this video? I noticed her hair is really getting overgrown and I got to trim the hair in front of her eyes. And I want the, the exercise I was going to work on her with, for example, is to go to a placemat, which I wanted to make sure she was, you know, there was nothing wrong with her, with her vision. So we just worked, worked Orfeo, for example, in the, this week in the, um, in the in the demo video but health has to be an example you know has to be has to be part of the plan and of course diagnosis do you know why the dog is being disobedient and are oh sorry for all the typos are you addressing the heart of the problem and <laughs> lots of typos this is what happens and attitude with a u in the middle attitude leads to our behavior so with all the dogs that you're training please if you think a dog is misbehaving because you just think the dog is being a jerk or a dick or an a-hole or something like that, stop training, learn about why your dog is really misbehaving. You know, why is the dog being reactive? Why is the dog not responding to your command? If the best answer you could come up with is the dog is a dick, all right, go backwards and learn some mythology learn to diagnose the, the problem the right way. The reason why is because especially when we're dealing with punishment is you have to have the right attitude. Instead of the dog being a dick, we, we, we need to understand what it really, you know, what, what the real issue is, right? The dog is more concerned about its safety and is acting aggressively rather than listen to you. It's more, there's always a reason. Um, because with punishment, we want to be careful. Punishment could be self-fulfilling to people. Some people actually get positive reinforcement from being able to stop a behavior and punish a dog, not because they're doing it the right way or they're doing the best thing for the, for the dog, but it makes themselves feel better because they're having this jerk dog pay for being, being a jerk, right? We don't want that to ever happen. So attitude always has to be part of a training plan. And these videos are designed for professional dog trainers. So working with your client too, you always spend time first having the owner understand why the dog is misbehaving before you allow them to do any type of training that allows punishment. Very, very important. Don't forget that step. Um, so we also, everything, we want to make sure we have our our leadership, our leadership in place, right? If, if the, we want to have our leadership in place, we want to make sure we understand that the dog's drives are being addressed first, that we have, that there's nothing going on that's technically a habitation problem or any, or an anxiety issue. There's a lot of things that could be happening before we do high level obedience that if we don't address, make doing the obedience more difficult or can be solved on a lower level. So do not forget your foundation. And of course, right now we're going in, look where we are in the chart here. This is phase three avoidance conditioning. We have videos for all of these before here, um, be um, before this. If you want to do phase three, which does involve the highest levels of punishment you're ever going to use on a dog doing obedience training, you need to really know what you are doing. So do not skip ahead. Do everything in order. Matter of fact, if you do not do everything in order, you're not really going to understand all of the parts or you're going to have lots of lots of questions that you do not need to have about this particular lecture, all right? And in, in that case, I could save some people who may be watching this some time by, you know, making sure they go back and, and watch the other videos if they're really serious about um, training, training, training the dog. Um, the other thing that we're gonna see here is that, um, is we're gonna continue to try working in the center of the dog training trinity whenever possible to get the fastest, um, to get the fastest and most reliable results, right? In the phase one, we're gonna continue using our variable reward schedule. You never graduate from doing reward-based training and be like, oh, now the dog has to do it, right? We're always including in any training plan, we continue to make the training 
desirable for the dog, that the dog knows when they respond to you, when they obey, good things happen. That never goes away. As much as possible, utilize what the dog would most rather be doing as part of the training plan. You want the dog to obey, and they don't even necessarily want something good that you have from them. They'd rather be playing or doing something like that. Incorporate it as part, as part, of, as part of the training. And here, of course, in phase three, is we are learning about how to use punishment properly, which is um, a continuous punishment schedule, which you'll see. By doing a continuous punishment schedule, which is 100% the time punishing the wrong behavior, either by a conditioned punisher um, or an unconditioned punisher or primary punisher, is the best way to be least minimally aversive to the dog because then they don't get punished, right? They don't get punished if they know it's always coming. And that's proven, all right? That's proven, proven by science. So that sounds all crazy and mean, continuous punishment, but that's actually designed so they don't get punished, all right? My favorite analogy, I probably beat it to death. Everyone's probably heard it, are those red lights with the camera in it. No one runs those unless it's by a total accident because you know you run that red light. It's going to take a photo of your license plate. You're definitely getting a ticket. So how often do people get tickets for running red lights that have cameras on it? The only time that ever happens is if someone really made an honest mistake. They, no one, no one in their right mind will purposely say like, oh, I'm going to disobey that disobey that red light because no one wants to deal with that with that ticket right and that's an example of a continuous punishment schedule versus speeding where you don't always get punished for that all right it depends you're only going to get punished if you know there's a police officer who's 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 watching you so before we go into seeing what a, what a session looks like is we want to see the command structure this is the command structure for phase three avoidance conditioning. So what I did with our regular command structure that we see all the time is I erased the little line over here, which goes, you know, from correction, assuming the correction is going to fix the dog, where we just praise the dog. We're working with, we're working in situations now where we know, we predict the dog will not obey um, with what we had available in our tra training regimen in just phase one and phase two. Like for example, in this example, we're gonna show Orfeo is we're gonna be working with a tug that he's very excited about. And no matter what we do in phase one, he's gonna choose to disobey and play with the tug rather than let go and go to a, we're gonna work on the place command for love or treats or anything like that. And even in phase two, where we give a mild punishment and teach him that he will, he will be allowed to go back. Um, so even doing milder punishment and pre-MAC principle, he still likes to hang on and bite that, bite that tug as much as possible. And it would be, we could not in any way, if this was a paying client, be able to say, here, I took your money. I am going to be accountable and make a plan where in this situation, if the dog is playing with a tug or biting on something that he really wants, that you will be able to reliably get the dog to obey on one command, all right? And Thank you for your money and here's your contract and I promise that I would do it, right? We need to be accountable. We need to have a plan that makes sense on paper, is in align with science, that the dog is able to do this. We can demonstrate that the dog can do this. And if an owner repeats the rules um, that we have taught the dog and understands that it can be that it can be repeatable. All right. So that's that's what we're doing. Now before we go to the videotape what is going to happen is in the last the the video the the obedience video that we have uh before this is the on our checklist is let me scroll up was the escape conditioning right we have a video on intro to escape conditioning and the intro to escape conditioning you need to do this we are working on 
place with Orfeo because it is something that he did not do. We didn't train him with the remote to respond and obey when he was all worked up um, biting a tug or doing protection work or something like that, even though he used the e-collar and we know his avoidance conditioning for other commands and high level distractions, we could not say on his checklist that we accomplished this. So it was a good one to do on the video to show you, to show you the process. So what we made sure before we did this, which was actually, this is just the next session that we did after the video that we saw in the intro to escape conditioning, where we saw and we were satisfied that he understood how to escape a punishment for the place command if he did not disobey, right? So he needs to know the escape conditioning for this. He needs to know the command structure. Um, he needs to know everything in phase one. We need to have taught him the concepts that we were on the same team as him, that um, we do incorporate pre-MAC principle. He understands if he does obey, that he's generally going to be able to do what he wants in most cases. All of this makes it so it's less likely we have to use higher aversive levels with him when we're doing the training. If you skip a lot of steps, it will not be nearly as smooth. And one great thing about, well, so many great things about this, is if you follow a system that has sinopraxis at its base and follows the guidelines of an unmutilated version of Stephen Lindsay's guidelines for Lima, not the ones that you find sometimes pasted on other organizations, websites, you have to go by the words of Stephen Lindsay. It gets mutilated a lot, right? It's unbiased work where he does not call certain collars automatically abusive or anything like that. It's science, right? Everything can be abused. So in, the, in this particular video, we are using the equipment that we're using is I'm using a Dogtra 2300 NCP. That's the that's the equipment that we're using on on Orfeo. All right. This is um so this is one of the Dogtra models. I recommend Dogtra to go back quick really review why we're using the e collar is you need a refresher. All right. Why is the rec why is it recommended to use an e collar in phase three? Because unfortunately you're gonna deal you we we still on the professional level deal with um, a lot of stuff about using e-collars. It's banned in certain areas. That is mostly due to incompetence, right? Uh, I would say majority of professional dog trainers do not real do not know how to use an e-collar in a way that would be compliant to Stephen Lizzie's definition of Lima. Some have no experience with them at all. Others are just using these as haphazardly as if there were no requirements to be a surgeon and you gave someone a scalpel blade and, and they were just 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 ripping people up with scalpel blades for 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 every single thing. All right. So so many of the most dangerous situations with potentially the worst consequences to the dog owner in public involve a dog being off leash. The e collar allows trainers to include avoidance conditioning to off-leash training plans. Also, the, qual the quality e-collar used by a competent trainer uses less physical force and is more adjustable than any known training device. That is a fact, right? If we're talking facts, that is a fact. Are there alternatives? Yes, there are alternatives, but all the alternatives that not I know of, and if anyone ever wanted to list an alternative, everyone that I know of uses more physical force to accomplish the same thing and is not as reliable, all right? Some of those things we talked about in previous streams, especially the escape conditioning phase three. So it's just a refresher why we do it, all right? Now, we're gonna go to 
our video with Orfeo. So I'm going to play this whole thing. I like unedited videos with nothing to hide. Now in this video, we work with Orfeo. First we have him on the leash and then we take him off, off the leash. Um, the reason why we had him on the leash for starters is because we really did the minimum amount of escape conditioning with this. It was the last session you saw in the escape conditioning, but we felt that he knew it, but we just started him on the leash just in case. When in doubt, if you think the dog may need some help, have the dog on the leash. We're confident and we found the level on the leash and then we did the same, we did um, the same plan off the leash. Now what we're gonna do is because right away we're not explaining what levels that we're on and you'll hear me and judy talking and we're going to be talking about the levels is what happens and this is in the if you look in the command structure that we show as well is well I'll go to the oh first let me show you is we're using we're using the dog truck 2300 but it's there's all different models that you can use for different levels of dogs remember Orfeo is a work, a work in line. He's primarily a work in line German Shepherd, primarily bred for police military uses, his bloodlines. They are amongst some of the hardest dogs in the world, meaning they are very good when they're fired up and being able to deal with real pain, getting punched, being kicked, even stabbed and keep going, keep biting, keep doing what they want to do, all right? So it's good to learn and watch a dog that is not easy, that would normally, if we were not using an e-collar, would be, it would just be brutal, all right? So this allows us to be not brutal, um, and also without using an e-collar, if you were if you were tried to map out in a way that this would work mm -hmm. by trainers that call themselves like force free and only use like no pull harnesses and halties, you'd end up like breaking the dog's neck or just not even being able to produce enough aversion to compete with the competing motivators. Now, when if you know the command structure, which you should know at this point, is Judy's going to be controlling Orfeo. When she gives him the command structure, when she's going to say his name, give him the command, which is going to be placed. If he obeys, of course, she's going to praise him, right? But what you're going to say and what you instruct a client if they're at this point is when they repeat the command, right? They did the escape conditioning at this point. They should not have to use the leash to help is what they're going to do is when they repeat the command, they do the proper correction to correct the dog for its mistake. So what happens is when he disobeys, she repeats the word place while at the same time, she presses the Nick button on the dog truck, which is on this model, it's the higher button up here. But every time she gives a correction, if Orfeo does not respond, what she does is she uses her top two fingers to guesstimate which she thinks is a proper increment for this particular dog, and then presses the nick again, all right? She seems to be doing about 10 jump increments. This model goes up to 127 levels, all right? Which is meant for dogs, it's a higher level e-collar that goes from, from one to 127. But what that means, 127 might scare someone, 127 levels on e-collar, that's because it allows you to fine tune, to find the exact level, right? There's some cheaper model e-collars that have levels one through 10, and then level three is not enough for the dog, then level four, the dog cries, it's too much, right? When you have something that has such small increments, you can find the level that is enough to motivate the dog, but is not, but is not enough, is not overkill, where the dog is crying in pain, or scared to do the training, all right, or scared to do the training. So, so every time she repeats the command, she jumps it, increments of about 10 on him, and then once he responds, once he responds to the correction, the next rep that we do, where we expect him to do the command and listen on one command, 
she starts at the level that he responded to. If he does not respond to that level, every time she repeats, she keeps jumping. About 10, but it depends. We're talking about a work in line German Shepherd here, all right? If we're talking about something softer, a softer dog, we could be doing increments of two to three, all right? So maybe even one, all right? You have to use your judgment. But she's doing jumps of about 10 until we find the level. And then once we're at the right level, if it is the right level, we will see he understands when it comes. He learned that in phase two. He learned when phase two came, um, where punishment comes in phase two. In phase three, he learned what to do with punishment. So everything going on here, he completely understands. He completely understands and he gets to make a decision. Oh, well, I take a couple of these, you know, the, um, the stem on my neck. Is it worth it while I enjoy myself while I enjoy the bite, all right? You can refer back to those three studies that you should ideally have watched before this on uh, all those studies that were done in the 1960s with like um, with rats and pigeons, right? Where if a rat was motivated enough and wanted food, it would stand, it would stand on a platform and get mild shocks in order to eat, all right? Because it was not, it didn't care enough to not eat. But then there's always a certain level where they're like, okay, I'm not going to eat. And we also have to, that's, those studies are also important because if we go up too slow or we use too much aversion on lower levels, ultimately the dogs can get used to it. And then you may find a point where you're maxed out on one of these, you're at 127 and the dog will still challenge it. You do not want that to happen, but believe it or not, that's possible with a lot of dogs if someone does not know what they're doing and they're doing low levels for too long and don't understand what phase three is for and the e-collar. The e-collar is so the dogs don't get punished, all right? Just like the invisible fence systems, right? You don't want them to get shocked by a high level e-collar um, every single day going to the edge of the yard. We want them to just know, don't go there, don't ever get, don't ever get high level shock, right? Or and in these cases, what you know we're doing is it's a higher level. It basically stims the muscle, right? It contracts the muscle. It's very annoying. The dogs do not like it. Let's get to the video, all right? And then we could talk. We could talk some some more. And please, if anyone has any questions that aren't covered, throw them in the pack howl while I'm teaching this, because sometimes there's things I may not be that clear about. And I'll go into the pack howl and I'll and I will answer him. So let's watch unedited video over here. Let's do it. You want to do off? I can take them off. You have to look at my yeah, face no, staring in here. It's not gonna hurt anything. Okay. We'll do one on. And yeah. All Just right. do. I mean, do it until he's doing it. And we can take him off. Okay. All right. Let's... Now before we start, there's two different ways. There's two ways a dog you know, that you may have to punish a dog. Um, um, one is when they break command, where you use the collar. One is going into the command. What you will find, which is pretty cool, is once you do one command with um, an e-collar with a dog, they can generalize pretty easy to other things. For instance, with Orfeo, he does not seem to break at all when he's in the place command and we're teasing him up. And he seems to be generalizing because he's done it down with e-collar around around distractions. But the different thing is the movement going into the place command, which is what we are doing, The mostly what we're focusing on with the avoidance conditioning. It's where we want him to avoid getting all punishment for not responding to the initial command. But what you can notice is right out of the bat, you know, right out of the box here, is he never really has to get any type of punishment for breaking the command. He's good staying there, but we're working on him going there in the first place. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. What do you got? What do you got? Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Place. 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 
Good boy. Good boy. So what we got there is Judy said Orfeo, place, no punishment given. Follow the command structure, all right? And he didn't respond. So then she repeated the word place. She repeated the word place, let's say. I'll go over here, all right? Said Orfeo, place. Did he obey? No. She then repeated just the command, place. Not his name again, just place. Did he obey? No. She repeated the command with proper correction, but this time she raised it, all right? She raised it. I'm not sure exactly how much she jumped it there. We start talking, you know, we start communicating with each other through the video. He didn't respond. And then she did it. I think she then escalated it again a third time. And if you really watched the video, you could see her finger on the remote there doing a little spin. And then he responded. So where at the the level that she was where he responded, that's where she's going to start now. And the number when, do not, when you're doing these lessons with a dog and an owner, you do not have them look to see what level each time they change it. They, you want them to get good at guesstimating. They usually know with a little spin about how much they're moving up, right? And that's what's most important. Then once the dog responds, they look and they're like, oh, I'm on this particular level, all right? So let's go back over here. So whatever level he finally responded to, and I believe she started on, I think she told me she responded like on like a level 16 or something, which is which is fairly, fairly low. And I'm not sure what she ended with over here, but we do start communicating with each other. So we're gonna do it again. Now he's gonna initially get the punishment, which is a nick on the dog tra that he responded to on that he did respond to on in the first rep. Okay. Let me take him off. So you're gonna keep him at that level now. Okay. Good boy. Okay. Oh. Good boy. Good boy. Camera good. Good boy. Good boy. Or fail. Place, 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 good boy. So another, she had to repeat the command three, the first command, no punishment. Second time she commanded, she started at the level that he responded to the other time, all right? Um, then she went up even higher, okay? This is how this is how you would do it. Now she's starting again at a little higher level. And this is the best way that we're gonna find the avoidance level with a dog, with a client dog, any dog, your dog, without overdoing it, right? If you notice Orfeo during this whole session, He's going to be wagging his tail. He's going to be happy. He's not going to want to just stop training because he's scared of getting punishment. He 100% knows when punishment is coming and they're thinking creatures, right? They, they learn exactly what we teach them. He's like, okay, I'm going to get a punishment for here. I could deal with it and I'm just going to hang on until it gets to a point that I think is too annoying and then I'm going to go back and bite. That's just what he's thinking, all right? So let's see. Let's keep going here. Good, raising the level. Okay. Or fail. Okay. Oh. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Or fail. Place. Place. Good boy. Good. Good boy. Good. You escalating? You sound your feet? Okay, good. Okay. Good boy. Good boy. So we're still doing the same thing. She keeps escalating the level. Okay. Or fail. Place. 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 Good boy. So it looked like he responded by the second one there. Now, um, 
Um, Ard has a good question. I see in the pack Howell. He says at this point in the training, avoidance phrase three, only time to use no is, and uh, it's basically, yeah, you, you can use the no for an honest mistake over here, right? So, and that's in the command structure, which normally here, but also in the command structure, if we look over here, all right, right, is what we're looking at is we give the dog, so he learns no, right? So this this is important question. Thanks for asking that, um, Art. Is we don't want someone if the dog, suppose like right over here, you know, did the dog obey? We say place, he doesn't let go. Or let's say he did let go, but instead he he just went into a down or a sit, all right? He, he did not obey, but he tried. He just made a mistake. You could then use the word no, you know, then try to direct them, you know, back over. And you will also actually see in this lesson, um, we we do use the word no in this in this particular lesson. You do not want to ever give a dog an unfair punishment. So if you feel like the dog tried and they just made an honest mistake, yes, you just simply were use the word no. And that's what makes it a fair lesson. And so the dog doesn't walk on eggshells and feel like it's the end of the world if he makes an honest mistake. But yes, absolutely, you could use the word no for of a any sit any situation that happens to pop up in the training session where you feel like the dog was trying and just made made an honest mistake um, um, you use those those particular judgment calls you especially don't want to be escalating using a higher level if the dog simply you know the dog was challenging it when you watch this video you will see there's not that much going on everything's pretty isolated we know what Orfeo does not like to obey, you know, when he's when he's biting the tug. We it's pretty clear to see that we're looking at the command structure when he's not even trying. So it makes it really easy. But yes, use those no's. You will see in the video a point where we do you an example of when you can use the the no in this in this video. So let's keep watching. And I think over here I ask Judy now what level that she's using. Okay. Good boy. They would level you on there. Uh, 47. Okay, yeah, make bigger jumps for sure. I mean, we started off really low. Well. Okay. Okay. So there I'm doing a little communication with Judy, right? And um, somewhere, I don't know, I gave her like a little, we're joking about it later, I gave her like a look, right? Like what? She said, she said she's on level 47, right? And this is, so... So her jumps, if she's on level 47, I don't know how many times she had to repeat the command, means she was probably doing a lot of increments of probably like three to four. Like I'm not, not that sure if she started, what level did she say she started? She started really, really low. Um, this is where experience comes into play and stuff like that and making, making the judgment calls. When the dog is being handled by someone who loves the dog, all right. Um, um, the training rarely, and they understand what they're doing. You rarely ever get like a bad session that you would be embarrassed to show like an unedited video to. Judy is actually making jumps in this video at far less increments than I would do. That's why I asked like, oh, he's not responding yet. Because with experience, you learn with each particular dog about what level they're on and what they listen. For instance, if I was handling Orfeo, handling German Shepherd, at that point, at this many reps, I would have already been at twice the level. And he probably would have been responding on the first command by now um, from me, me being cocky, right? But remember, I trained so many dogs and supervised so many people training dogs, I lost count, all right? And also I do that not because I'm a hard ass on a dog, it's because I know ultimately the quicker I go, the lower levels in the long run that I'm using. As the slower you go, that's that balancing act. The dog is like, okay, that wasn't so bad. That wasn't so bad. That wasn't so bad. Maybe I could take this one, all right? Where if she started off at 16 and then the, the next time he disobeyed, she was at 26 and then 36, 46, you know, he may have been responding over there. We don't know for certain. He has a very high pain tolerance, um, um, Orfeo, which is why he has the collar.
But remember, like, when in doubt, especially with the client, let them go lower. It's fine, all right? It's, it's going to be fine. I've never had a dog that we were not able to do this and get to where we wanted to be by going lower levels as long as they knew that once they find that level for that situation, don't go back down, all right? You want to see that dog responding to the level, and it is situational. What we're doing here with the tug would be completely different if it was in the living room and she just wanted Orfeo to go to her place while she was eating her bowl of popcorn and his slobbery face is too close to the popcorn and his drool is going to be in the popcorn, all right? It probably it would be at level 16 at the avoidance level. So every single thing, every single thing is situational, all right? And that's where the experience comes in. But when in doubt, go low. Let me see. Judy says, I started at 16 and just turned the dial a little each time without looking without looking too hard. Um, hard, you know, it's hard, hard to tell. All right. And this is okay. And that's why I love these unknitted videos. Cause this is so, this is very, very, very typical of what a training session would look like when you have like a client handling the dog versus you handling the dog. Um, but let's keep going here. Okay. Good boy. You went from 20 something to 40. Okay. Yeah. No, you should probably do it about 10, we, 10 we, jumps with him. I was. We were starting at 16. Okay. Ah. Oh. Good boy. Orfeo. Place. Place. Good boy. You, good, good boy. boy. Good boy. Now you can definitely see he responded to that second to the correction there. Let's watch that. I'm not sure what level she was on there. Orfeo. Place. Place. Right. Good boy. You, good boy. Good boy. What level are we at now? 58. 58. Okay. So it's 58. Good boy. Good boy. On you. Okay. Oh. Good boy. Good boy. On you. For fail. Place. 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 Good boy. Good boy. That we got. I'm assuming she's a little higher now. Good boy. We still didn't get what we wanted. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good boy. Good boy, buddy. Oh. Good boy. More Place. Place. Good boy. Yeah. What level are we are? 67. Okay. What? No. Good. I jumped at 10 from the prior. Okay. Orfeo. Okay. Oh. Good boy. Good boy. Orfeo. Place. So there we get our first official one where he decided to avoid it. And I have such bad short-term memory, I forgot even what level that she said, all right? It's like 60, we'd say 67 or something like that, which is about about halfway up what this what the e-collar can can do, right? Let's see what happens. We got a freebie there. What level we at? Um 73. 73, okay, so keep them there. Now she didn't in retrospect after, I think we talk about it afterwards, he was, she, he didn't get a 73. The last one that he got was whatever, a 60 something. But then she escalated it because she was ready to do a higher one if he didn't respond. All right. But let's see. He, I don't think he gets the, I don't think he gets the 73. Oh, great. Good boy. You're too tired. So it's 73. Yeah. 
Okay. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. He's a good boy. He's a good boy. Good boy. Let him be on the little one. Okay. Ew, good boy. Okay. Good boy. Porfeo, place. Good boy. Good boy. Good. So you can see he's responding. Not super crisp, but this is where the judgment calls, all right? It's always good to have someone handle the dog that loves the dog, all right? And then you can shape it. She said play. She waited. She saw he was trying. And she may have um, said place again with a, with a punishment, but I think Judy had good judgment there. She saw he started letting go. Then she even gave him a little bit of help. And that's why it's always good when in doubt to stay with the leash. You know, she kept him on the leash and gave him a little bit of help. But we now have two reps where he did not disobey, where he was at least, he at least tried. We didn't get perfect. But we're getting what we would now consider avoidance conditioning. He's learning to avoid all punishment. Let's see what we get. Let's see what we get on the. I think we do a third one here. Boy. Good. 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 Uh, go again. Okay. Okay. Oh. Good boy. Oh. Oh. Good boy. Oh. Good boy. You good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Ready? Yep. Orfeo, place. Good boy. Good boy. You are good so boy. smart. We'll let him just have it this time, all right? Okay. And you'll march him around after I give it to him. Okay. Okay. Good boy. You so smart. You okay. so smart. Oh, God. Good, Good boy. boy. So there, you know, we see. I saw he was getting tired. This could be very tiring. That was like, you know, a little warm out. It was like six minutes or something Good into the training boy. session. So smart boy. boy. So we had to give him a break. All right. But. We got three where he did not have to get punished. And now we give him a little bit of a break. And then we do him off leash. All right. So let's see what happens. Oh, and here goes our no. So, all right, to, ask, to answer your question, all right, you could still use the no. So we started off, she started off with the place with the e-collar, and he just like, he saw his Kong, which is his favorite thing in the world, and he just veered off. And we don't know if he's not, for whatever reason, he disobeyed, but Judy decided to use the word no, and he 100% responded. There was no primary punisher, no e-collar had, had to be used, and she just praised him. When we were starting the next, you know, we gave him some water, we let him rest for like 10 minutes or so to let him, um, to try to get some energy back from him. So you see here, this is where the no comes into place. Oh what a good boy. So smart boy. Good boy. Where is it? My head comes in here and shut it off. No. There goes our no. Good All right, boy. That's, that's where a condition punisher Ooh, comes in. Excellent. Pass the recording. Okay. So now, let's see, me and Judy communicate with the level a bit better. My camera is like that here. All right, round of two. Can I put this down? Yeah, you don't need that. Round two. Okay, so first one, actually the last punishment he got was at 68. Yeah. And then we escalated. Right, but he, was, but he responded to 68. Yeah. He responded to 68. So let's start it. Let's at start 60. at 68. So we're okay. going to start at 68. We're going to be ready to do uh, to do a a jump. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Oh, good boy. Good boy. Give him a few, a little longer time on this. Okay. Can you tell me when? Okay. Oh, you good boy. 
You a boy, you are careful, baby beast. Oh. Good boy. <laughs> Good boy. I'll be on you. Good boy. Orfeo, place, place, place. Good boy. Oh boy. See, I had to correct him on 68. Yep. So jump it up. Okay, so he jumped up, and here he looked actually like, looking at the video, that he he may have let go on his own, but we also want him to be quicker, you know, quicker and more crisp at this point. So she jumped it up, and let's see what happens next. Good boy. Good boy. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Good boy. <laughs> Good boy. Good <laughs> boy. Boy, you go, boy. Oh. All right, on you. Or fail. Place. Place. Good boy. Huh? Eighty-one. Eighty-one. Huh? So now we're up eighty-one. Good boy. Keep him there. Good boy. Little monster. Right. So now he got a okay. punishment at 81, and I believe that's it. I think he decides boy, it's not worth taking the punishment anymore, and then that's Good it. Boy. I think we get a freebie here. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. All right. Okay, ready? Or fail. Place. Place. Oh. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Where are we at? Yeah. We're at 84. That's, we're on the last one, bro. Okay. Right. So you raise it? Mm -hmm. Okay. question from art and so that session that's a very typical session actually with a um that you could do with the client and even my own sessions and the ones over here with judy like we can critique it and i i like this i was actually happy like after we've done the video first i was like oh we should after i was talking with judy i was like we should have been escalating a lot quicker than that um but then um in retrospect i like it because it sort of shows some things like when you're training a dog like ultimately right you're trying to make progress in a session and as a professional remember like clients are paying you know paying you for your time right so they want to move forward with each training session or if you're doing in kennel right you want each training session the dog to learn something in that case with orfeo for example i thought that was the session, don't get me wrong, that would be considered a successful session because within one session, even though we, we broke it up there, we gave him a little break and that, he was out, I guess, probably for a total, you know, he's probably out for a total of like 20 minutes maybe um, outside for a training session. 
what should be typical for, for a training session. He got a little break, you know, and then he went back in. Is we were able to accomplish him avoiding punishment. So we got him doing it on leash. Then we took him off leash, did some adjustment. And then we saw him get two freebies where he's definitely not avoiding it. So then from there, we know we can, you know, we can adjust. Now if we were to take him out for another training session. Just to show you have to make judgment calls. I would guess he finally was responding on like 87, right? The remotes go up to 127. So we're in danger of getting it to maxed out, which you don't want to happen. And just to let you know, I've never had with the higher level dog trick callers, I've never had a dog that I was not able to do reasonable obedience, um, um, you know, within the range that it has to go. And Orfeo using the e-collar for other things, the only time he's ever been maxed out, which he may not have even have needed it on that high of a level, was an emergency new situation a few years ago where he ran in a new situation. He ran towards a, a busy highway towards an animal that he was never at. And Judy, I think he didn't respond to like his normal e-collar correction. She just maxed it out, gave him a pop because he had escape conditioning knowledge. He knew right what to do and came running back. Right. That was the highest he ever had. But he understood it because he had escape conditioning. That's the only time that she knows if she ever had to max him out. Never had to max him out protection training or anything like that. Because remember, there's also, he's doing it for other reasons. Don't worry, he's doing the obedience also because he knows he gets to do it again, that it's not so bad. And he's getting praise and he's getting all these other things. But if I was to critique this lesson, which I did afterwards with Judy, it would be like, the escalation was way too slow for a dog, you know, for him, knowing the levels that he can particularly take, where we risk him burning out in the training session and probably get in a higher level than if we would have probably went from like, you know, you see starting up at 16, like doing at least 10 jumps each time she repeated herself, where he ended up at what high 80s or 90, I forgot, where... I think if earlier on, we probably could have got him responding 70s or something, you know, knowing him. But next training session, what you would do is I would probably start him off in the same exact situation is maybe starting off around like 70 and then jumping quick to the higher level that, that we did. But ultimately, what your goal is over here, going into understanding when do we know we can move to the next step in training? is what you're looking for is you're looking for a dog that reliably avoids all punishment in a single training scenario that normally could not have been accomplished in phase one and phase two alone. That's really important because we're talking about our, our checklist here, right? We're moving along with checklist. Is what There's more steps over here, all right? I mean, there's more steps. There's phase four. All we're looking for, if we want to check that off, is, um, which I would say in one more training session we could check it off, is I want to see, or maybe like two or three, is I want to see we take them out in that training scenario and we see we don't have to punish him. He's just responding. He's responding on the first word, go into place in that drill. I know he understands the concept of phase three avoidance conditioning where he knows he understands that there will be a punishment that he definitely doesn't like, and he 100% knows how to avoid it, all right? So the quicker you get him to that point, use your judgment, the more Lima that you are, right? The least averse is we tend to do less and usually don't go as high. The quicker that you can get them to that point where you're using those judgment calls, all right? But once you get to that point, if we do a couple training sessions, and they do, they all do. And this is what I was doing in kennel. Very, very important for when I was doing in kennel dogs. You know my like ugly um, dog training area, 51 room that's in the basement that people like to make fun of. It looks like a serial killer would be down there, right? I had that room for a purpose, right? There was no windows. There was not much going on. I would get a dog doing some simple phase three there, or if I couldn't get him to do it there, I'd bring him out into like the training yard or the parking lot 
once I saw a dog reliably in at least one training training scenario knew how to avoid punishment um, in phase three for some in a scenario they normally would not if I was using milder punishment and just positive reinforcement, then I knew I can check it off and it gets us ready for generalization, which we'll do a whole nother video about, which is that's when you get them good in that situation. It is much easier for the dog to understand it in another situation, all right, where we're basically going to do different situations, especially focus on the ones the dogs are commonly going to be in and the problem area situations, then that's really what ends up getting us to the point to the dog that you can really take in all its most common situations that it usually has to be in and is not getting punished. That is just not getting punished. And it's a beautiful thing. To give you example, I'll go back to my, to, I had a dog, Rhoda. She was an American bulldog that I had years ago. I trained her all with the e-collar, but I used to use her as an example. I liked her as an example for when it's conditioning because she was a very, very good girl, but she was protection trained and I would use her for demos and around the house. She was so good. Never really had to use an e-collar. The, the two times I knew I had to, that I, that, that was important to me to use e-collars. I used to like to take her hiking and I knew she would chase after deer and stuff like that is once I knew she responded and there's for each, for each command, there's slightly different ways you can make it safe, right? In her case, I had her like on a flexible leash, making sure she responded to e-collar. But once I knew, she knew that there was a punishment that she did not like, she'd rather not have it. Um, she was 100% reliable. I never, ever had to press that button for years and years in that situation for her, taking her for hike. And I used to use a demo dog often in different places there was this one animal hospital for years she was like the main i would bring her to be a demo dog we would do a protection scenario surrounded by a crowd of people and horse that was that was there to do pony rides other dogs walking around that were on leashes we would just put up a circle you know made a barrier and i would have her off leash where normally i know she might want to investigate another dog um, or horses or see people. I knew in that situation, she, she knew her phase three avoidance in that situation. She did multiple years of doing demos where I never, ever had to push a button after she actually did it. And you want know, to be able to do these nice, cool demonstrations and never have to do anything. And that's typically what you would see when people watch a lot of like the bike club videos that I used to put like on YouTube is where the clients were working. That's why I showed that first video is some of them are still using punishment, but others it's rare. It's rare. They would have to use punishment because the dog knew in this scenario, I know what's going to happen. I know how to avoid it. And all those other things were in place. All right. But for purposes, for purposes of just, checking this off over here all right let me say we got avoidance conditioning right we're doing place all right here with orfeo is i would have this circled right these other things over here these are already all xed off right all this was xed off i would be looking for if i can go out and do a training session and to the reasonable person it was like oh yeah you just can't punish this dog in this situation anymore he knows how to avoid it I'm Xing this off, all right? And then I'm gonna to move to generalization, bringing them into, into different areas and stuff like that. So that's how that's how that would look. Um, I saw I saw Art had a question. He said, um, suppose you're doing um, personal protection with a dog that unlike Orfeo has never done bites on a bite suit, but does know avoidance out with a tug. Start with escape out for the bite suit out or go right to to avoidance out yeah so that would be considered generalization art if the dog had a really good out on a tug and was never on a bite suit assuming the dog had was trained foundation style like we're teaching and the dog understands pre-mac principle that it's probably going to be able to bite again 
and it's being praised. It has all the phase one stuff, phase two. If the dog does it on a tug well, then yeah, you pro then you would. You would be a you should be able to go to avoidance out. But new situations, I generally underestimate a little bit to give the dog the benefit of the doubt and then escalate quick. All right. And if the dog was exposed to it the same way in a different but very similar situation, it generally goes very, very, very smooth. All right. And um, and so this lesson, it's there's kind of a lot there. Right. Even me trying to talk quick. Right. It's so hard to keep 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 a lesson short is um, it's in the foundation. And the proof is in the pudding. You have to watch the dog, right? You have to watch the dog. If you have a dog that looks tentative, looks scared, does, doesn't does want to continue with the session, right? Or Feo was choosing, which is a good sign, choosing to go back and keep biting and go all out. He was getting tired. He was choosing to keep participating in the training session. And that means a lot, all right? When you have dogs that stop taking treats, stop participating in the training session anytime you obviously see it in the body language you got to go back and troubleshoot right also you notice he never cried or anything like that all right that's why the equipment is important all right i trust the dog to if he was crying in a training session that's an immediate stop the training session what happened right it's possible people overestimate that it's okay that you go down sometimes it's bad equipment sometimes it's other reason but it is actually normal what you saw there with orfeo is considered what a normal training session is supposed to look like it's that is that wouldn't be considered abnormal at all even the slow incrementing i was a little bickering with judy there normal normal all right and that's you would rather that than someone overdoing it and jumping too high when in doubt smaller increments I've never had a dog where if the owner and the trainer, if they had a plan, they knew what they were trying to achieve. They knew they were trying to find that level and, um, and then they can adjust as necessary. It's possible to be like, I think that's a little too much. You can go down as long as the results are the dog in that same situation is predictably always avoid and punishment, all right? If you see dogs challenging it, deciding and taking it, you have to really start troubleshooting, which is, you know, not, I like to do the, I do the chart quite a bit, but remember here, we're talking about competing motivators, all right? That situation with Orfeo, he can do it for us or he cannot do it for us in that situation, you know? Um, and, what what motivates him to possibly not obey, all right? The reason why he did obey is it holds equal, equal weight. When we're talking about competing motivators, whether it is an agreeable experience or a disagreeable experience, they, they hold equal weight as far as is it a motivating factor. For example, the only reason for Ofeo to disobey was the pleasure of biting the tug, all right? His reason for obeying was something agreeable. He was getting love. He was getting love from me and Judy, all right? And he was, he was also avoiding punishment, all right? There was the e-collar. These are his competing motivators. And let's say it was, I, don't, I forgot what it was. What did we go to, level 87, I think it was? All right. Now you have to be aware of these things because suppose we just even stopped loving them and praising them for it. We don't, this may have been, to be an equalizer here, this may have, may have to go up to level 110. All right. Or let's say all else is equal. I'd say this was 87 over here and we're love. And this wasn't the tug. It was just some like, we're telling him to go to place and he was busy sniffing some rabbit poop. All right. All right. I'm sure we wouldn't have needed a level 87. In this case, maybe it really would have been like a level 17 or, or maybe not even that. It might have been the least detectable, the least de um, detectable level. All right. 
Um, so, or we were also giving him food, you know, hot dogs or something, all right? Again, that could lower it. It's, it's a mathematical equation, basically. It, it's science. You should be able to put it on paper. It's always explainable, all right? That's why you have to keep records and you need things to, to troubleshoot there. So, so if, um, if we're doing protection training and someone is beating on Judy and she sends, you know, she and, and Orfeo goes to bite the person, all right, is if for some, it would be, he's, that's when he's the most, most fired up, right? So that would require the highest level to, it might even be impossible level to keep him in a downstay if Judy was like, here, you stay in a downstay and I'm going to get beat up in front of you. E-collar may, may not even work, right? You have to be, you have to be reasonable. But Orfeo's biting someone, Orfeo's in the process of biting someone that was beaten up Judy. Now Judy is somewhere far away and she hears Judy just do a regular recall because he loves Judy. If for some reason he didn't respond because he was enjoying biting, just the fact that he's concerned about Judy and likes to be Jude, likes to be with Judy and we trained him the right way, you would be surprised. He may be at a level 20, even in that situation, compared to him biting the tug, which seems less intense to protection training, but she knows Judy is right next to her and she's safe and he's not really worried about her. There's, right, so it's more, it, it's a little bit more complicated than, than, than just this, which is, you know, I'm jumping ahead into, of course, the generalization here because I can't shut my mouth. So I love, I love, I love talking about this. All right. But as a, let's recap. All right. So hopefully you guys learned something here today. Um, and yeah, what is the next step in training? Next step is generalization. This is where, this is where we train the dog to be reliable in many different real world environments. The sky's the limit. It, it really is. I mean, I've never met a dog that cannot be trained to obey reliably in reasonable situations that you've probably seen or heard of dogs um, obeying before, you know, before. All right. So what is phase three avoidance training? It's the process that teaches. It's a process. Remember when we're doing this, what we were doing in there, it's a process. We're teaching him to avoid the punishment. So we know we go to the next step when he can avoid all the punishment, right? Um, it's different in phase three because in phase two, you're teaching him the process, but we really don't get to that point in phase two where he really is avoiding it in the highest level environments that you ultimately want to, to reach your, reach your goals. Refresher about the e-collar. The e-collar... If we're being educated, we're not talking about rhetoric. We're not incompetent. We just don't have the right exposure to the right thing. If we really know what we're talking about, phase three is inarguably, if someone knows what they're doing and how to use it, uses the, le the least amount of physical force for the same amount of motivation compared to someone getting equal results in the equal situations without using an e-collar, all right? Um, I stand by that. If someone could ever prove us trainers wrong that are doing it this way, of course I would change. Why wouldn't I? I would change and do it and do it a different way, especially when we're talking about off-leash off -leash reliability. Prerequisites for four start and phase three avoidance is everything, all right? This is really going on to advanced training. Understand that dog have the right relationship with the dog. Do not skimp. Let the dog know why it's good to respond. And then you're not going to have the side effects. You get, you'll get a good presentation in the training session like we got with Orfeo there. That was definitely, as much as I'm nitpicking on Judy and myself as, as the instructor, that is a that would be considered a successful dog training, um, dog training session. And that's what it looks like, all right? That's what the training session looked like. And the command structure, it's right over here. You basically just have to have to be prepared. Every time the dog disobeys, just pop up the level a little bit each time. And then I, I, I wrote it out for you over here, all right? Then, then 
then once you find that level, you start at that level, all right, for that for that situation. You do not want to be pressing that button, all right? You, and by doing this, you are Lima. I probably, if there's a way to use less aversion on a dog to get less results, if you follow the escape conditioning with the e-collar and then do the avoidance conditioning, you will see because we're mainly using the nick, the nick is we're talking microseconds of stimulation. It's not even a second, it's microseconds compared to a lot of more traditional ways people are using the e-collar that are not really trying to follow um, a Lima, a Lima foundation. We're talking seconds of higher level e-collar in the process, like minutes. Like we're not if you if you were to do the math. The process, we're using a fraction. We're using like point something percent of the aversion of what it would take if someone was not doing a phase one, phase two, phase three, teaching condition punishers for honest mistakes and then following science to really get to the to the to the minimal level necessary to get the dog um, to get the results that you that that you really want. Um it's we know where we we know ready to move the next step and the dog's not getting punishment that's that's simply what we're we're really looking for and we're using just the condition pun we're using the condition punisher for honest mistakes and the dog is not challenging right so there's a huge difference between what we call false disobedience the dog disobeyed but they didn't disobey to purposely just defy authority or or rules they make honest mistakes Condition punishers are there to save us over there. All right. Next up is generalization. Thank you, everyone, for, for learning, for sitting through these with me and doing your best to be one of the greatest trainers in the world. I love what I've been seeing from you guys. I've been seeing happy dogs, happy owners, and happy trainers that don't have to make excuses for what they do are truly enjoying themselves. That's really what it's all about. Um, I'll be back for Q&A, except I'll post this too. There's something going on that I can't change in my, in my schedule. It's very rare that I can't do Q&A on Wednesdays. But this week, my Q&A will be on Thursday night at the same time, 9 p.m. New York live Q&A for those that are that are members of, of the site. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yeah, great questions, Art. Thank you.